Hey, Cypher here, coming at you with, a guess, a bit of a listicle. You see, us historians have a bunch of pet peeves that we, you know, kind of have to deal with just because of the nature of our profession. So I went around and asked a bunch of people, like, what they considered to be their most annoying thing, and came up with a list. This is all I've got for a script, by the way, so, you know, let's see how we do just winging it. And there's a few ones that only a couple people said, and there's a few that, like, everyone said. Or that when the topic was brought up in a group, everyone kind of went like, yeah, screw that. Obviously, this is a list I compiled just by asking people, not by a bunch of, like, survey work or anything. This is just about as subjective of a survey you could possibly get. But, at the same time, yeah, I'm kind of annoyed by every single one of the things on this list. So today, we're going to go through the things that historians found the most annoying. At least the ones that I asked. So I put this in an order, kind of according to what I think and what others were saying, as to what is the least annoying to most annoying. So this is only going to get worse and worse as we go along. So number 12. One-dimensional characterization. This is basically when people talk about historical characters as if they were, you know, flat Stanleys, that they had nothing to them other than one trait. Obviously, no human being who has ever lived has been that simplistic, but you'll see that kind of portrayal a lot, especially in movies. So this is typically the absolute good guy or the irredeemably bad evildoer. A lot of historians are kind of pushing away from the whole concept of trying to label things of good and evil, including myself. We need to step beyond that. But if you have one dimensional characters, can't really do it. So number 11, history is somehow boring. Yeah, I hear that a lot. In fact, I've heard it a lot from folks that I would normally think would be rather into historical subjects. And oftentimes I want to just respond with some snarky response like, Oh, you don't like stories? What a miserable life you must live. But really, this comes from just bad teaching. A lot of history teachers just kind of teach from the book. And so all they want from their students is to memorize a bunch of like place names, people's names, event names, and dates. And that's not what history is. History is a story. And if you can tell it right, then it's not boring inherently. We like stories. There's never been a human being who doesn't. And yet, we often try to say that history is boring. Well, that just means you're not looking at it right. If you find Game of Thrones interesting, look at the medieval ages that it's based upon. If you find World War II interesting, it's World War II. People clearly like historical movies, so why not actual history? Well, it's because they've been taught wrong. And so they have a view of history that is just bad. And it's our job as historians to fix that. But you really can't dig through if somebody is automatically just ignoring you just because you're talking about history. And history is boring, I don't want to listen. Well, that's called being ignorant. So oftentimes, when people are saying history is boring, they're actually choosing to ignore you. And at that point, well, you can't really help ignorance. So moving on to number 10, judging with modernity. Now, you see this all the time where people will say that like, oh, this happened in the past and those people were bad because that's not okay nowadays. Well, it's all right to say that something isn't okay now, but to judge somebody because they lived in a time in which it was okay is not understanding how time works. You can't just jump into the past and say, you're a bad person, you're not living then. And this is another reason why historians often try to avoid value judgments altogether. 
we can't really help ourselves sometimes, but, you know, it's a noble goal. Plus, sometimes you can't really tell where modern judgment begins and judgment that would apply during that time ends. You know, if you're saying that, you know, some president was hated during his time, Okay, sure. That you can say. But then you start talking about why, and that starts getting into possibly you applying your own judgment. So this is something that is also a fairly subjective thing. Hence why judging with modernity is fairly low on the list. Because, well, it's kind of hard to define. So moving on to number nine, the Holy Trinity of US history. Oh boy, I've already done an episode on this a long time ago. Unfortunately, a bunch of hateful Redditors managed to take down one of the episodes that were conjoined with it, but you gotta roll with the punches, I guess. Go and check that out if you want a deeper explanation. But the whole idea is basically there is the Revolution, the Civil War, and World War II. No other subjects are important in US history. It's a real problem for publishing because publishers are really only looking for that and those are the only real popular subjects to publish on. In recent years this has been getting better, but only slightly. It's still a major problem where you can't get published unless you're talking about World War II. Even look here on YouTube. The most popular subjects is World War II, World War II, World War II. Maybe some stuff about the Civil War and Revolution, but never anything else that's important. Because that's where the views come from. World War II. Everybody wants to know about World War II. But the subject has been done to death. At one point, the History Channel was literally called the Hitler Channel because it was just World War II all the time. There's 4,000 years of history and we have to focus on six of them? Really? Number eight, newer is better. This is another one of those phrases that I hear all the freaking time and it gets annoying. Think about, you probably have a friend or maybe you are one of those people who think that like, you can't watch black and white movies or silent movies because they're boring. Which is just like, so maddening. You're necessarily cutting off things that might actually be better than current productions simply because you have what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, which is basically the idea anything newer is better. But the world isn't always progressing. In fact, oftentimes it's moving in the opposite direction. If there's any directions in the first place, but we can definitely look at things that we say are the ultimate thing right now and say, well, actually it's been done before. Chronological snobbery is actually another thing that people use simply to ignore history so that they don't have to deal with the pain of the past. If they cut themselves off from things that happened in the past, oh well, it's because it doesn't matter anymore. Newer is better, but yet again, that's just another form of ignorance. Number seven, alternate history and historic fiction. Now I wanna start this one off by clearly stating I am not saying that historic fiction is bad, nor am I saying that alternate history is inherently bad. The problem is it can go wrong, both of those things. Now, I'm actually a big historic fiction fan. Like I review historic fiction movies and, you know, read books. In fact, sometimes I talk about historic fiction as being important. For instance, it's pretty hard to deny how important this book was for changing the way Western history is done. And yeah, these things have an effect on how we perceive history. That's important to understand. But they often can have negative side effects. People will often take fictionalization as fact. And that gets into some real problematic territory. And that becomes especially prevalent with alternative history. Alternative history 
is kind of just doing hypotheticals, right? If done well. You know, what if some small change happened? How much would that have changed the world? But you get into some pretty bad territory when you start saying this is what would happen. Because alternative history is just historic fiction. That's it. It is not history, it is historic fiction. But you can reveal a lot of things through it. You can see how important some minor little thing was. Like Alternate History Hub did a video on 9-11 showing that like if Flight 93 had not been delayed for 20 minutes, it probably would have hit its target. That's a heck of a change to history off of one minor little detail. So historic fiction and alternate history often walk a fine line of what could happen as opposed to what would happen. And that's the problem. As soon as you move into that would territory, then you're talking in factual statements rather than hypotheticals. Number six, superlatives. Oh boy, superlatives. Yet another one that I've actually done an episode on long ago. So basically a superlative is best, first, only. Anything that is saying an absolute. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. There's nothing quite like a historian saying something was first that gets me going, ah, wait, no, there's gotta be something that came before it. I mean, think about it. When we say Columbus discovered America, what about American Indians? Obviously they were there first. Yeah, but they didn't get the word back to Europe. Well, if you want to talk about Europe, first Europeans to the New World, then obviously you have to talk about the Vikings. Yeah, Norsemen came to Newfoundland and went back, but their stories were recorded or spread properly to make it a discovery. So yeah, I guess Columbus is first, right? Yeah, but once again, you see, that is where people are like, can't say first, and that's the problem with superlatives. You'll get some historian going like, ah, it's not the only time this happened. It's not the first time this happened. This is not the bloodiest event ever. So on and so forth. That's why so many historians couch their things with things like so many. You see, I'm not even saying all historians. I'm saying so many because I have this reflex. Eventually, superlatives kind of just get beaten out of you by the system, right? But for good reason. So let's move on. Number five, naturalism. So there's this thing called the naturalistic fallacy, which is basically like thinking that anything natural is good. Well, arsenic is natural. You don't want it to be one of those natural ingredients though, right? That kind of like, you know, faith healing kind of BS, that's not really our wheelhouse. That's for scientists to debunk, right? No, what I'm talking about naturalism is a much more pernicious thing that a lot of people don't even realize that they're buying into. People tend to think that some standard thing is just a natural state of society. Think about like how many times that we say that like war cannot be ended because that's just human nature. Most of the things that we think of as just a natural state of history turns out to not be true. For instance, nations are new. They are imagined communities. You've probably seen this book referenced in a number of ways across YouTube, talking about how like communities form or anything, but that's actually negating the subtitle of this book. Reflections on the origin and spread of nationalism. Yes, nationalism is a new thing. It's basically a 19th century invention. And this applies to so many other concepts. Think about race, gender, class, 
These are all things that have a history to them. They're not just static objects naturally available throughout history. They have to be constructed. As one historian explained this rather succinctly in my opinion, many historians bridle at such claims with an instinctual dislike of the naturalization of any social reality and a mix of distress and pity for triumphalist claims of an end of history. But basically, a lot of historians are going to instantly go like, whoa, you think some social thing is, you know, something that's always been there? It's a construct. It's something that we built over time. That doesn't mean that it's not real or doesn't exist or whatever you want to say. Society obviously exists, but it had to be constructed. But that means that there's a history to it and a consequence from its creation. And this serves as kind of a bridge to number four, which is popular misconceptions. The way naturalism and popular misconceptions coincide is the idea of traditions, especially false traditions. Things that are not actually that traditional, but people claim them to be traditional, despite there being no actual history of that practice. Traditions have to be started somewhere, too. It's not as though they just come out of the ether. And there are a lot of popular misconceptions oriented around traditions, where people think that something comes from something, and it turns out that, oh no, it was actually something that was made up three centuries later. That's basically the entirety of Braveheart, by the way. And the reason why popular misconceptions are so problematic for historians is that we have to constantly fight them. There's so many things, like that Slave Myths episode from a while ago. So many popular misconceptions in there, and yet people hate being told they're wrong. Even though, yeah, that's exactly why historians hate popular misconceptions. Let us do our job. Number three, believed omniscience. This is going to take a bit of explanation, but essentially people often think that historians are just like Rolodexes of knowledge. Like I'll tell somebody that I'm a historian and then they instantly start quizzing me about World War II when it's like, I, I don't know, I don't care. Not my subject. Go away. You know, at some point, I won't know it off the top of my head. And I have the benefit of this channel forcing me to do a bunch of research into things that are totally outside of my field of study. A lot of historians get really pigeonholed into a particular subject. Now you can argue whether or not that's a good thing, sure, but generalists also happen to be jacks of all trades, but masters of none. And you'll see this kind of thing portrayed in media all the time. For instance, there's this TV show called Timeless, where the main character is a historian who gets to time travel to like fix the timeline from like these time terrorists. It's actually pretty fun, but oh god, there's so much of this myth in there. There's parts of the show where they literally just say a date and the protagonist just goes like, oh, that's the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And then next week, they'll name off a date again, and is oh, that's when that Zeppelin burnt up. And it's like, no, that's not how historians function. We don't just, like, memorize a bunch of dates. Like, history is the story of us. Get it through your frickin' head, media. <laughs> history is not just memorizing names and dates and events and all that kind of BS. We went through this with the whole history is boring thing. You guys are the ones making it boring. And this misconception about us, like, knowing everything has even worse problems because people tend to be uncritical of historians. I mean, come on, you've watched this show, I make mistakes all the time. And this whole perceived omniscience thing makes people think that if you make one mistake, you're no longer a historian. Oh, there's a lot of comments on that. We are not just Rolodexes of knowledge, we have to study. As my dad, who is also a historian, will often say, 
I may not know it, but I can sure find out in a few hours. Moving on to number two, which is the absolute worst thing you can do as a scholar. Plagiarism. Plagiarism may not be a crime, but oh man is it a crime in academia. If you use somebody else's work and don't credit them, that can often get people to lose tenure or plain get fired. Seriously. A couple examples of some really high profile cases of this is pretty well portrayed in Peter Hoffer's book, Past Imperfect. And there's some names that you guys might recognize that were some definite plagiarists and that has soured their reputation forever. Specifically, Doris Kearns Goodwin and Stephen Ambrose. Yeah, the Band of Brothers guy. That guy was a plagiarist. And I know historians who will refuse to see that show simply because of the plagiary. That's how serious of a problem this is. And they're not wrong. In the scholarly world, we trade on reputation, not on money. Well, having good selling books is important and pretty nice for the bottom line. It's not the thing that makes your career. What makes your career, and really what makes a historian in general, is advancing scholarship about history. That's what a historian is, is somebody who advances scholarship about history. And you're not advancing it if you're taking it from other people. That's called plagiarism. For instance, I'm pretty sure my master's thesis was plagiarized within a year of it being put out. I put a heck of a lot of work in it, and it would have been nice if there were more quotations of the, my actual text in that guy's text. But from what I can tell from the digital online, you know, preview thing, it looks like he quoted me without crediting me, and that's just plain wrong. But, as my dad said, that seems like a family tradition. You can't do anything about plagiarism because it's not an actual crime. You can complain about it. They're literally stealing your work, your hard work, all that time you spent in archives digging through 150 year old documents and some guy comes along and goes, that's interesting, I'll use that. But all of these annoyances are nothing compared to the final one conspiracy theorism. Now I'm pretty sure I've made it absolutely clear my position on conspiracy theorism, but I'm not alone. This was by far the most common one that people brought up, and as soon as it was brought up, everyone went like, yeah, screw those people. It's pretty difficult to get a group of historians to unify around saying screw somebody, especially if it's not some you know, figure like Hitler or something. It's really difficult to say that about just regular people. But conspiracy theorists will always draw the ire of historians. Because essentially the whole idea of conspiracy theorism is to deny history. Essentially, they are the exact opposite of a historian. Now I've done a lot of episodes talking about like the logic of conspiracism and how these people kind of twist things to their advantage just to propagate a myth. But the basic idea is that they find something that is an official story and then deny it and then come up with their own story instead, not based on any proper evidence. Conspiracy theorists lie. That's what they do. That's the whole point. They may not think that they're lying, but they are. And the only way they can do so is by denying evidence. Historians stock and trade. I'm not going to get into specific debunking things because it's no use arguing with these people. They are already too ignorant to be argued with. But I do want to talk about that there's a hierarchy of how bad it can get. So, kind of at the low level is like silly ones, you know, like flat earthers. They're not really doing anything about it, they're just kind of getting together and 
propagating a myth. Okay, whatever. Then you've got major event denialists, you know, who say something like, Oh, JFK was shot by multiple people, or frickin' the moon landing was faked. You know, that kind of thing. But that gets to an even more pernicious level when they take those kinds of, like, you know, JFK was shot by the CIA because LBJ wanted to become president. And, oh boy. The level of ignoring evidence you have to be at in order to say that is already astounding. But then there's, like, historical conspiracy theorism where they think that there's, like, some grand conspiracy throughout history. So a good example of this would be Lost Causers, who think that the Civil War was not about slavery and that Reconstruction was purely a punitive thing against the South. And need I remind you what you get if you were a lost causer? Yeah, that guy. Wilson! Wilson was a lost causer, but he came at a time in which lost cause revisionism was actually okay. You have to understand historical theory advances over time, and there's sometimes bad theories that just, you know, kind of end up in their own little cul-de-sac and that's it. Fine. You guys got it wrong. That's okay. You can get it wrong. And Wilson was in that territory. Okay, you can get it wrong. The problem is he used his pernicious ideology to institute an entirely new form of imperialism, but that's a problem with Woodrow Wilson, not the subject here. He wasn't a conspiracy theorist, he was actually a historian. Just a bad one. No, the problem is, people still believe in this defunct theory. It's dead. And over with. Yeah. The Civil War was about slavery. Slavery is at the root of basically every political problem. There. But... Oh, no. You're just a northerner trying to push your regressive agenda. You don't really understand our true traditions. <sighs> it's a combination of so many annoyances on this list, if you've noticed. It's kind of building up to that. And then, there's a level worse than that. Yeah, all this hate that's propagated by these malicious conspiracists, you know, the very real violence that they cause, all of that in which I've already named, like Charlottesville itself, is kind of there. There's a lot of causes to it, but Lost Cause Revisionism is a major part. But the worst is atrocity denialists. These people. I have no words. I cannot even imagine the hate that must boil under the surface to propagate, you know, anti-Jewish stuff like Holocaust deniers. Those are the worst. The thing that historians hate the most. And I can say that for sure. It's a form of conspiracy theorism, taken to its worst extent. At least historians are well aware of their stupidity and malice. But it sure makes trouble for everything. In fact, everything on this list is troublesome in some way. But you can see, we went from rather benign stuff that are just kind of annoyances to basically the most hateful thing you could possibly be. But that's what you deal with as a historian. You gotta deal with these things. But hopefully now you know better. <laughs> but hopefully knowing these things, if you're doing one of them, maybe you'll 
learn a little bit about why you shouldn't, or now you're a little bit better prepared. I'll see you next time.